Good morning. morning. Take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 3. This is probably one of the most um, well-known Bible stories in the Old Testament. It was one of my favorites when I was growing up. This one in Daniel in the lion's den. Also a favorite of mine. Uh, but it certainly has a lot to say to us in our day and age. And uh, so I want to uh, share with you a little about it this morning. I don't know if you heard uh, the, about that couple in Colorado who lost everything they, they owned. They, 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 gave, they sold it. They sold everything they owned to buy a 28-foot sailboat. And they spent a year refurbishing it, and they set out to sea. On the second day out, the second day, uh, their craft struck something underwater. The water flooded the cabin, and the couple grabbed their Social Security cards, cash IDs, and their dog and had to flee their boat. The woman told a reporter, everything I worked for, everything I've owned since I was a child, I brought with me. It's just floating away and there's nothing I can do. Now that's pretty, pretty bad when you think about it. Uh, she does say the boat sank, but our dreams didn't sink. However, there, there are a lot more challenging things than losing everything you own. Um, Polycarp. Anybody heard of Polycarp? Okay. Polycarp uh, was a disciple of the Apostle John. Remember the Apostle John? One who wrote the Gospel of John, the book of Revelation. Well, Polycarp was, he's a celebrated figure in church history uh, a direct pupil of John, the apostle. He lived between A.D. 70 and 155. Polycarp was arrested on the charge of being a Christian. Amidst an angry mob, um, the Roman proconsul took pity on this old gentle fella and urged Polycarp to proclaim that Caesar is Lord. If only Polycarp would have made this declaration and just offer a pinch of incense to Caesar's statue, he would have escaped torture and death. But this is what Polycarp said. Eighty-six years have I served Christ, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And so because Polycarp refused to compromise his beliefs, he was burned alive at the stake. In uh, chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, we find a challenging situation. Remember Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 had this dream about this huge statue this figure of a man with a gold head and silver chest and uh, bronze legs, thighs, and, uh, and the iron, um, iron legs and feet. And actually the feet and the toes had mixed in with the iron clay. But um, he saw this figure, and so uh, Daniel told him that his kingdom was the greatest and so he decides to celebrate that, it seems, in chapter 3. Because in chapter 3, we find that he built a, a, an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width was 6 cubits. Now, you don't probably know what a cubit is, but it's a, about a foot and a half. So we're talking about a statue that was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide out in the plains. Now, there's a, there's a story in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 11, that talks about the land of Shinar and the fact that the Babylonians are, are there went out and they built a tower 
They were going to build this tower to the heavens. Remember the tower of? Yeah, you've heard of that. Well, Nebuchadnezzar decides that he's going to uh, do the same thing. He's going to build a statue out there. And he invites all of his officials. There's a whole list of them here. Um, there are uh, satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the officials of the province. All the who's who of Babylon. All the important people, all the rulers, <clears throat> all the people under Nebuchadnezzar that are serving him in his government. And uh, he brings them all together, and then he has a herald tell them uh, in verse 4, this herald cries out aloud, after all these people have gathered out in the plain uh, to, uh, to do what Nebuchadnezzar has called them to do, whatever that is. Uh, this is what the herald says. To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery. In other words, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's got his band together, his uh, official band, and he's, he's got all of his orchestra together. And when they play their music... He says, you are to fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a fiery burn, a burning fiery furnace. Uh, so at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image uh, which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. That is, except for three. And the three were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thank you. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They refused <clears throat> to fall down and worship. So there's uh, the first thing we confront. And here's the deal. You are going to be confronted with the idols of this world. There's nothing wrong with sports events, but you know what? Uh, in this book, uh, The Daniel Dilemma, Chris Hodgins tells about a time when... Uh, He went to a sporting event. He says, the scene around me took my breath away. Thousands and thousands of people surrounded me, and I witnessed every act of worship mentioned in the Psalms. Shouting, singing, uplifted hands, laughter, clapping, chanting, dancing, and joyful expression of every variety. The volume of so many vibrant voices escalated into a crescendo of ex exclamation <clears throat> and exaltation. Men, women, teens, and children of various socioeconomic, cultural, and educational backgrounds united together to celebrate the immediate object of their devotion, <clears throat> excuse me, the University of Alabama football team. And this wasn't even a game against another college team. The day I was uh, one of more than 90,000 people watching the spring practice game of the Crimson Tide, a scrimmage between the Crimson team and the white team. If you've ever been to a large-scale sporting event, I bet that you can imagine what I was seeing. The scene before me was simply amazing. With all the preaching I do, <clears throat> everyday experiences quickly turn into sermon illustrations and learning opportunities. And this moment, he says, was no different. He talks about uh, one of the denominations, uh, the SEC, <laughs> and the worship that goes on in college football. And not just college football. We witnessed a real worship event a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? You know what he said? 
He said that his one wish is that someday at his church, people will be shouting as loudly and as excited at his church as they were at that scrimmage game with the University of Alabama. You know, I think we have a lot more to be excited about here than we do at a football game or a hockey game or a soccer game or whatever is your favorite game. There's nothing wrong with sports and there's nothing wrong with games. <clears throat> but there's something wrong with elevating them above our allegiance to Jesus Christ. And at some point, you're going to be challenged by this world to either cave in and give in to the idols of this world are you going to have to stand up and be different? That's just the way it is. And our culture's getting worse. Uh, our culture puts more and more precious pressure on us to conform. Pressure on us to cave in. Pressure on us to get in line and walk the line like everybody else. That's, that's the kind of culture we're living in. And it's getting worse, isn't it? You know, as far-fetched as it seems, what these three experienced, we may experience real soon, where there are real consequences. Well, there are always consequences. You know, if you don't go along, you're going to lose some friends. Us, you know, you may be um, in jeopardy of losing your job. Uh, you may lose income. And someday you may end up being faced with the possibility of losing your life. That's what these uh, three faced. And we find that in verse 8 of this chapter that they refused. They spoke and... Uh, well, actually... Uh, Although they, they refused to bow down and worship, um, the second thing you need to realize is that there are those who are going to criticize you for your stand. There at, at that time, it says, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. They were very respectful. <clears throat> you, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the orchestra shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. There are going to be people, if you take a stand, who are going to criticize you for that, who are going to call attention to it. <laughs> Don't you like the, the way they approach it? Uh, they remind the king, hey, you put these guys in charge, and now look at what they're doing. They're not showing you respect. I believe we live in a culture of disrespect. But I'm not advocating that we be disrespectful. I'm advocating that we be as respectful as we possibly can. But there's a difference between deference and respect and going against my convictions to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a difference. They're not the same. And uh, I... I'm sure I have lost friends, and I'm sure I've lost opportunities because of who I am and because of whom I serve. But I don't regret that. I'm like Polycarp. I've served the Lord for about 58 of my 62 years, and He's only treated me well. I, I can't go against him after all he's done for me. 
So you're going to be criticized by the people of this world if you follow the Lord. The third thing is you're going to be challenged to worship the gods of this world. And uh, that's where we find them in uh, verse 13. Nebuchadnezzar, when he finds this out, goes into a rage and fury. <laughs> There's nothing like monarchs who are, they feel they're disrespected to, to fly into a rage. And he gave the command to bring them here, bring them to him. So they brought these three to the king and Nebuchadnezzar spoke to them. <clears throat> and, he, and he asked them, is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound again, uh, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now, and who is the God who, you, who will deliver you from my hands? Now, here's the thing. He gives them a second chance. Maybe they just... Maybe they weren't in the mood. Maybe they weren't thinking it through. Maybe they just needed a chance to go over the scenario again and figure it out. Make a different decision. But guess what? They don't. And they're going to answer the king. His question is, who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, that's the bottom line. It comes down to who is going to be your master and whom are you going to follow. In the Old Testament, there are three gods mentioned over and over again. One is Baal. Baal is the god of pride, of self-aggrandizement, of self-promotion. <clears throat> And we live in a culture that wants to promote itself. We're all about ourselves. I, I mean, just think, selfie has become a part of our language. Now, there's nothing wrong with you grabbing a picture of yourself. I'm just saying. But when you get dozens and dozens and post them on Facebook or Instagram, I'm just wondering. But it's not just about selfies, is it? It's really about our preoccupation with ourselves. Almost, if you will, our worship of ourselves. And there's another god or goddess that's mentioned, and that's Asherah. Asherah is the god of pleasure, or the goddess of pleasure. Of course, we don't have to worry about that one, do we? with pornography flooding the internet to the point where some are saying it should be banned altogether uh, because of its effects, particularly on young people. By the way, the effects on the brain and other things, you know, um, we're, we're losing contact with what it means to really relate to other people, not just sexually, but in every way. And then there's a third god that's mentioned in the Old Testament, Mammon. Anybody heard of Mammon? Remember when Jesus said, you cannot serve God and Mammon? Some of the modern translations substitute possessions or money because Mammon was the god of possessions. Now, obviously, that Colorado couple found out that, you know, it's really... Something when you lose everything, you watch it sink into the ocean. But 
It's just stuff. Why do we get so excited about stuff? By the way, I needed to... Well, it's not working anyway, so you just have to look at that picture. I had another one to show you, but obviously you need to see that one. Think about it. Uh, it's stuff. It's not our lives. It's not our health. It's just our stuff. It can be replaced. You know, you can buy it again. It's just stuff. These three young men understood very well the God that they served. They said, essentially, our God, we can trust our God to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down and worship your image. Well, what do you think that did to Nebuchadnezzar? Verse 19, was full of fury. And the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In other words, at first he was giving them an out. He was saying, look, reconsider this. He wasn't really upset with them at the time. He thought, well, maybe they just weren't thinking about it. <clears throat> but now that he sees clearly they're not going to recant and they're not going to fall down and worship, he's furious. And so he decides, you know, it's not hot enough, this fiery furnace. We're going to crank it up seven times hotter. And uh, in fact, he got it so hot that the people that were going to, the men that were going to throw the, the three in, what happened to them? It says here, and he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the bur fiery, uh, burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because of the king's command that it was urgent, the furnace and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <clears throat> so they throw them in, but in the midst of throwing them in, they lose their lives. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose in haste and spoke, saying to the counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. When you are faced with the challenge of the world to bow down and worship, you're going to need courage. Did these young men have courage? I like what uh, God tells Joshua. Moses is gone. Now Joshua's got to lead these people in and he's got to help them conquer the promised land. And three times God says to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. We're going to need some courage, men and women. If you're not going to bow down to the world system, you're going to need courage. And number five, you can be confident that God is with you. What happened to these three? They didn't lose their lives, did they? A faithful God stood with them in the midst of the burning fire and delivered them from it. In fact, I love, I love how it describes it here. They were brought out of the fiery furnace and they didn't, their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. 
Can God deliver in such a mighty fashion? Can he? Of course he can. Does he always? No, obviously not. But whether it's three boys in a fiery furnace that God delivers them out of, or it's Polycarp who dies for his faith in a burning flame, the same God stands with them and with us. And that's the good news. Jesus said, the la one of the last things he said to his disciples, Lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age or the world. This is what Diedrich Bonhoeffer, by the way, who uh, wrote this before the Nazis hanged him naked with piano wire. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, 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 a Christian in Germany at the time that the Nazis were in power. And he was um, actually end up being a spy on uh, that regime. And uh, just before the war ended, he was put to death for his faith. <clears throat> he said this, the church must confess that she has witnessed the lawless application of brutal force, the physical and spiritual suffering of countless innocent people, oppression, hatred, and murder, and that she has not raised her voice on behalf of the victims and has not found ways to hasten to their aid. She is guilty of the deaths of the weakest and most defenseless brothers of Jesus Christ. The church must confess that she has desired security, peace, and quiet, possessions and honor to which she has no right. She has not borne witness to the truth of God. By her own silence, she has rendered herself guilty because of her unwillingness to suffer for what she knows to be right. That was the church in Nazi Germany, the church where countless religious leaders fell right in line with Hitler and supported him and supported his agenda. There are times when we're called upon to take a stand. And when we are, we better be prepared to take a stand. Because here's the reality. Jesus said, If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, what will he do? I will also deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Do you want to be denied by the world or denied by your Savior? Let's pray. Father.